So nice to see you. I'm Evan Lotti, executive editor at PC Gamer Magazine. Thanks for coming to our panel. I am so pleased you're here with our distinguished speakers, which I'm going to bring onto the stage now. All right, joining us today, all the way from the Czech Republic, Dean Hall. We also have Chris Roberts. And John Mavor. And Chris Taylor. Thanks so much for joining us, gentlemen. So now I'd ask that you please rise and remove any hats or cosplay material as we play our PC Gaming National Anthem. Glad you guys played Doom, that's good to know. I'm gonna move this microphone so I can talk and sit. All right, now that we've got that little bit of PC gaming patriotism out of the way. Just wanna begin, oh sorry, I'm trying to get the right distance here. Just wanna begin by asking you guys, um, you know, if you're visiting the show floor at PAX, big presence by Microsoft and Sony. PC Game, of course, is enjoying an, an incredible renaissance in terms of business models, in terms of te technology, in terms of gameplay experiences, narrative experiences. So right now and for the foreseeable future, what do you see as the greatest strengths of PC gaming on the eve, so to speak, of new console launches? Not having to deal with console stuff when trying to release your game. <laughs> and by stuff, I mean BS. Yeah, what would you describe as console stuff? Well, I think particularly like uh, the very nature of the console, you're building together this thing that's heavily standardized. And I think that, that comes down to the hardware as well as the process you know, that you have to go through to get your game uh, you know, approved and all that kind of stuff. And I guess the, the positive of that is the consumer gets a very packaged experience, whereas I think PC gaming, in a lot of cases, offers this sort of broad uh, open canvas that you can paint something on. And I think, you know, that's, that's what a lot of people like, certainly what I like about the PC, and which you haven't been able to get with the consoles, at least so far. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say on my side that the PC never stays still. It always changes, always gets better. There's always things to challenge you every year. Um, you know, consoles get, tend to be static and PCs open. So you can do what you want and you don't have anyone really telling you what to do and what you can't do. Um, and for me, that's, that's what you want. Why not? Well, when someone tries to make money uh, by keeping a system controlled and closed, it's just not as fun and exciting as a is an open platform where you can do whatever the hell you want. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the way it's been for t ever since I can remember, over 25 years. Except for on Windows 8, right? <laughs> <laughs> we, don't, we don't talk about Windows 8, John. <laughs> or Vista. Vista, yeah, it's with Vista. 
So I'd like to, you guys to sort of look into a crystal ball and tell me what you think the next big thing in PC gaming is going to be. I guess it, it, it depends a little bit on your own, uh, you know, the things you like. So for me, multiplayer gaming is really where it's at. So I like seeing how particularly players who maybe play, play even different games or different kinds of games together so that they have this very unstructured PvP experience. So I like to think that's the next big area, but I think it depends because, you know, there's, there's many different flavors of PC games. And so, I don't know, yeah. But for, for me, that's what I'm most interested in. To me, the crystal ball is pretty clear. Oculus Rift, that's the next big thing. <laughs> uh, VR and the social multiplayer experience. I mean, those two things, I think, uh, are going to change the way that you play. I mean, I can certainly... Star Citizen <laughs> plus Oculus Rift. <laughs> that's the next big thing. <laughs> After 25 years of guessing at this shit, I really don't know. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I'm curious, let's, let's talk about the Oculus a little bit. Uh, how long do you think it'll take for it to be a widely accepted device? Like, at what point do you think it'll hit a million, uh, a million units sold? I don't think anyone knows the answer to that yeah. question. I don't. I, I think, though, uh, from my experience with it, I don't think you can cookie-cutter the Oculus to any game. It really does feel like, to me, having, having played it in that, if the game's not built around it, there's a danger of you even being sick with it. So I think, uh, I don't know, it kind of feels like to me that if you really want to make it work, you have to make your game around it. Like, like the EVE VR, Valkyrie's a perfect example, I think, of a really awesome experience. But you notice that you, you, know, you don't stop moving the whole time. Um, and I think there was another... There was another game I saw that you're actually static the whole time. I mean, that felt really good for it as well. So I, 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 as a designer, it certainly feels like to me that making sure that your game, if you're going to do this VR type game, I think it needs to be done with that in mind. Otherwise, yeah. It's from scratch. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. I would go even further and say it's actually awfully difficult to solve a lot of, a lot of those problems, yeah. and we don't have them all solved yet, but uh, I'm confident they will be solved. Uh, the kinds of games that, that you've worked on recently, uh, would be fun, but probably aren't as good a fit as what, what Chris is working on in the short term, anyway. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think they'll hit a million units when the consumer unit's out and uh, you have certain games out that work really well with it, which I'm hoping my one will be one of them. Um, but, um, you know, the other, basically any game involving sitting in a cockpit flying around yeah. is really good for the, for the Rift. Walking around first-person shooting, uh, not quite as good because you're not able to actually walk around, so that, uh, it's slightly disconcerting a little bit, but, I, but I, I definitely think the experience you have in the right kind of game completely changes your immersion into the world, and that makes a whole difference to the experience. And, and, the, and to be honest with you, the amount of money that they're shooting for for the, the consumer version, I think is something that PC gamers, uh, you know, $300, I mean, you, you would spend that on a monitor, so I know plenty of people that have, you know, huge, crazy six monitor setups. Um, so I, I definitely, I mean, I think, I think probably next year is when you're gonna, you see it sort of become mainstream. Yeah, because I mean, the track IR, I think it's like $200 anyway or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, there's the reason why there's big lines at PAX or Gamescom. It's, a, it's, it's fundamentally a different experience, so it's pretty awesome. So speaking of hardware, more on the graphics side, is there anything you guys would like to see from NVIDIA, from AMD in the next five years? Any, any sort of wish list you have in terms of features you'd like to see them provide or better cooperation, cooperation from those companies? Not having to use DirectX. Hmm. Really? <laughs> Why's that? I'll, I'll go even further and say, you know, we've abandoned DirectX at this point. We're 100% OpenGL because we want to be cross-platform on Linux and, and Mac and all that kind of stuff. And, once you do that, there's not really a point in supporting DirectX, except the drivers are a lot better, so we, we pay a price for that. So, Yeah, but it'd be much better to go straight to the, the hardware if you can. Oh, hey, yeah, yeah. If they want to let us go straight to the hardware, I'm, I'm, I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've so, only got two major manufacturers out there, so yeah, there you go. No, I th it's, it's definitely something that could, could happen. So that kind of raises the question, how, how long is PC gaming going to be Windows gaming? Uh, 
I think that's up to Microsoft. They've been doing a pretty good job yeah. trying to kill it. Uh, you know, games. <laughs> oh, you know, games for Windows Live, the Windows 8 App Store that you basically can't sell games on. I mean, all, all these things. Uh, you know, hopefully we'll see some reversals there. But they've been doing a good job trying to to push it. I think everyone's hedging their bets a little bit right now. Um, I'm confident that something will be called a PC and we'll 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 use it for a long time into the future though. Yeah, well I mean I look I think in I think PC the, the crowd talks. So uh, Microsoft always tries to change things around and then ultimately they sort of backtrack. So you're even seeing it now, the next Windows eight release is basically going back to look a lot more like Windows seven. You can have your start on the left side and, and you can you can run everything that you can do on Windows seven and Windows eight. You just you just want to get rid of all that kind of iPad-ish. I'm curious interface. how many folks here run Windows 8. So about 15 percent. Yeah. But I wonder how many of them run it like configured as Windows 7 as well, because you can you can sort of reconfigure it as we, Windows 7. So I think yeah. How many, how many people have start start 8 instead yeah. of uh, or start 7 or whatever one is? Bailiff, please remove those people from the room. <laughs> All right, so talking more about the, uh, the you know, each, each of you guys has a key role within your studios. And I, I'm curious from your perspective, being independent, you know, publishing PC games, what are the challenges of keeping a, a, a PC gaming focused studio afloat in 2013 and beyond? Well, I think I, I know from uh, like the studio I work at now as well as even previously, like uh, coming up with new IP is really good, particularly when that new IP is really successful because it gives you, I mean, it's a businessy word, but it gives you a franchise. And I think what that really means is maybe an indie designer is it gives you a mandate to take a, a story or a concept and really flesh it out over even a few games, which means that you can kind of sort of fix, thing, fix things when they're right. But, uh, you know, I mean, trying to get, for me, definitely trying to get something out the, out the door that uh, has enough in it that you can achieve your objectives, that's probably what I find the hardest. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say that I, I, I do find it kind of funny that everyone thinks that PC gaming is sort of this poor man's gaming. I mean, first of all, Chris has, you know, just joined wargaming.net, and how many people do they have? <laughs> We're up at 60 million registered users. Right, and, uh, and how many people just at Wargaming not doing basically one game at the moment? I know there's going to be uh, well, World well, of Planes and World of yeah. Battleships, but right now it's only World of Tanks supports about how many developers? Well, the company worldwide with all the publishing and all the PR and marketing, the whole group, I think we're over 1,700 people now worldwide. So, so that's, that's essentially one game because they're not really well, making you, revenue you off the other two out, just yet, you right? You've got to carve out all the development for ships and... Right, but planes. I'm saying supported, the re they're being supported by World of Tanks. I'm not saying that sure, everyone's sure. working on World sure. of Tanks. And then you've got Riot Games, which is huge. Uh, you know, all the Blizzard stuff's all PC. So, I mean, I would actually say outside of Grand Theft Auto and Call of Duty, some of the biggest, uh, you know, franchises and revenue is actually on the PC, which is why I always think it's crazy that people think PC is sort of the poor cousin to the console, because I think on the PC gaming business, it's always been there. It's been faithful through console cycle after console cycle, and uh, it's it's, it's you, it hasn't gone away. So I think th everyone's just here. Do you think that some that. of that comes from uh, the console people maybe having more coordinated PR effort and saying, "Oh, we've sold 20 million units of this game, and we're the biggest thing ever," and all that kind of stuff? But I also I, th I think their costs can be really high as well because of some because of a tremendous emphasis on production value. Whereas I think definitely a lot of the games that I maybe play on PC. They don't have so much value in production value, but in the game design itself. So if, if you're not spending as much to make it look pretty and market it, then it means your margins is really good. And, and certainly that's what I think from when we look at making console ports of our games, we're like, well, why? Because they want us to do a box set, which we're going to get a fraction of anyway, whereas we can digitally distribute on the PC. And we don't have to market the heck out of it, so we're, we're getting a much better margin. So is that your answer to the original question about what makes it uh, possible to uh, run an indie PC development yeah, studio? Yeah, I'm hearing you guys say that it isn't as hard as people think. Yeah, that's what I would say. <laughs> I, th I, I think actually if you make games specifically for the PC, there's a huge PC audience there that will support you. I mean, that's certainly been what I found in Star Citizen. And I think the problem has been is that people have just ignored the PC. I mean, it's why I wanted to build Star Citizen in the first place. I was sick of playing bad ports of a console game that was based on seven-year-old tech on my top-of-the-line PC with, you know, this video card that could push ten times as many polys as I was 
you know, having games push. So I said, okay, I want to make a game that does that, and that was what the gist, that was what the gestation of Star Citizen was. And I, I think if peop, more people make games specifically for the PC audience, I think they would be rewarded. And I think people are missing a trick by not embracing the, the PC gamer, because I think it's been the longest the, and the most loyal gamer out there. I mean, it's, it's, that's what I started. I mean, that's when I was making games back in the 80s. It was you know, but, but I also, very early PC. I also think as well that like, there's many different kinds of indies. And certainly at this table, maybe the, the bigger indies, or even, you know, like there's indies and then there's indie indies. And, and I think that the indie indies will say it can be really hard to get someone to, to buy their game or really hard to get on Steam. And even, you know, Gabe Newell admitted that the green light system is really tough for, for people to get their game out there. So I think, so, you know, in some ways with the consoles, it can be a lot easier if you can get someone to sign and make your game and put it in a box edition, put it on X, you know, Xbox, Xbox but, Live or something like that. You, I mean, it's definitely, I mean, I, I'd have to say in that case, I don't agree with you because it's much harder on consoles as any, a normal developer oh, or an yeah. indie developer to even get any visibility. So yes, okay, Steam green lights, you know, maybe it's not so easy to get in there, but you can take any other avenue, right? So if you're on a console, you have to publish through Microsoft, or you have to publish through Sony, you have to publish through Nintendo. If you're a PC developer, yeah, okay, so you can't get on Steam, you could, you know, go your own way. And I mean, the biggest issue is just getting visibility, and that's a problem no matter what. Yeah, like, you're, you're right. It's definitely a lot easier with the PC, but I think a lot, what a lot of the, the smaller indies would really like would be, a, be, be able to get on, a, uh, on Steam or that much easier. I, I think the other thing to look at is uh, the mobile side, because that's another interesting kind of counterpoint. And I feel like on the mobile side, you can create a product that's actually pretty good Get it on there, no problem, but it, you, you won't necessarily it. make any yeah. revenue on it. So to me, the PC is a beautiful sweet spot between, you know, dealing with console nonsense and, you know, the kind of total crapshoot of mobile. Um, I think Valve does deserve a lot of credit for the current mm. market that we have. I do realize there are people that have a hard time getting onto Steam, and I do hear people complain about that. But, um, you know, it is what it is, I guess. No, but also Steam isn't the only... There's plenty of other options on the PC. You don't have to go through Steam. It just there, happens to there be are, the and you've, you've done a good job, I think, you know, just doing stuff direct. We do the same thing. But Steam, you know, everyone I've talked to is like 80 to 90% of the market, which is, you know, pretty dominant. Yeah, so that makes me curious. Does Steam, were you guys at all as a monopoly? Should there be more diversity? Is there not enough? I, wouldn't, I don't worry about that too much because I think if, if they start to abuse it, that other people will step in. I mean, we have a lot of other folks already in, the, in that business that are doing pretty well. You know, uh, G GOG, Humble Bundle, all, all these guys are doing mm -hmm. good stuff, so. Yeah. That's fair. Great, so all and, and by the way, that's yeah. because the PC is open, that yeah. you can actually do that, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a really, really key point. I, I think Microsoft has lost sight of the fact that the thing that made the PC successful is that people can do stuff with it, yeah. and they aren't restricted, so let's just try to keep it open. It really feels like, to me, and maybe this is oversimplifying Microsoft's strategy, but it's like they looked at what happened on iOS and with Apple, and they were like, we should be doing that. That's not the Microsoft that I grew up with or the Microsoft that I wanted. I wanted the Microsoft that were going, this is why people like our platform, and we're going to innovate and do all this stuff. They were just like, well, they're making a lot of money by having this closed platform. We should be doing that. But that's totally not what Which, what which doesn't even make sense, because Apple doesn't make their money off the App Store. They make it off the hardware, right? Like, Microsoft can't really copy that model. No, so. it's, yeah, so, I, I mean, think we've I, seen the end result of this, right? Balmer's out, so maybe we'll see some changes. <laughs> Should be interesting. So, John, you brought up, you know, of course, as we're all acutely aware, one of the PC's greatest strengths is its openness, but it also sort of inherently means that there's a little bit of fragmentation in the PC space. You know, you have hardware makers, you have processor makers, you have Indies, AAA, AA, B, whatever. Um, so what, I'm curious to hear from you guys, like what are some better ways that all those forces can get together and cooperate? And, and is that something you'd like to see happen more? Well, I, I mean, I, I, maybe, I, I see that happening a lot. I mean, you see all the, the GPU manufacturers are always doing uh, various bundles with different software. And uh, I mean, I, 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 actually, I've got a, how many people here have built their own PC? Wow. wow. Okay. Wow. So here, here's, what, here's what the thing is, and I have to say that this is, this is definitely because when we finished 
our initial crowdfunding campaign on Star Citizen, we ran a, a survey of everyone that had backed it, and we had a pretty, uh, you know, pretty significant sample. I think 40,000 people responded, which statistically basically is, is like saying this is the whole amount. And 82% of, resp of everyone that responded had built their own PC. And I think that why everyone, you see all these things about PC sales are down and you know, Dell's having problems is not because there are less people playing PC games or even buying uh, PCs, it's because everybody's building their own PCs because, I mean, it's, it's actually kind of fun. I do it now. Well, it's like building Lego. Don't you, you think, remember, remember back in the 90s, you had to build a new machine like every like 18 to you know, 30 months? Of, but, you know. it, but it was scary building it back then. Now you right. like literally just plug it in here and there, and you go, "Oh, well, I want this the, GPU with this motherboard, with this CPU, with this case that looks cool." But you, you don't need to build them. You, a, you get more out of a machine. So of course, you know, if we if we can go for like say three years on a on a decent box, you know, that's going to slow sales down. But it doesn't mean we're slowing down playing PC games. So I think they're just reading the numbers wrong. Well, yeah, but I, I would also say that people tend in the PC setup as you tend to upgrade. So you, I'm sure lots of people out here build their own machine, and then when a new GPU comes out, they're like, okay, I want that new GPU, and they just plug it in rather than if you're on the console, you would have to wait till the next console True. cycle happens. There's also some more complex analysis with regards to which piece of the market is buying iPads, and are those the same people that were playing PC games anyway? You know, if you're a hardcore PC gamer, you're probably not going to switch over to just using your iPad all the time. You know, if you're, where, at, where at, so, so if those people my, left the my, market. La my laptop can't even run, like the, the Star Citizen hangar module, and I've got a 680M in mine. And uh, it's not particularly smooth. So I want my nice desktop running it with a fast GPU. And, and I think ultimately what you've got with a lot of PC gamers is they just like the best experience. They want to ha have the highest fidelity. They want to have the most immersive experience, and ultimately, I think the PC is the platform that will allow that. And you can see it because it changes every single year, and that's why things we're talking about Oculus Rift. Well, you, Oculus Rift couldn't exist in a console setup, right? That's that's exactly the kind of thing that's great about a PC. Someone can say, "Oh, I'm going to do this great peripheral and build it for PC gaming," and then yeah, maybe down the road, one of the console manufacturers would want to take something like that. But they could have, you could have never started Oculus Rift without PC gaming. And there's a bunch of other examples that are like that, and that's what's great about PC gaming is that it's basically the it's where everything starts. I mean, even all the even the major console games like Call of Duty, it was a PC game before it was ever a console game. That's true, and, and it's the diversity there that actually, uh, and the competition that creates these new opportunities. Yeah, I mean, that's, so for me, I mean, that's, that's what makes PC gaming great, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be making a PC game. 20 <laughs> years from now, are we going to have consoles, or are we going to just have PCs? And I say PCs. Well, considering that the, the new, two new consoles are basically PCs. Yeah, well, there you go. Uh, I mean, they, they go. are PCs. They just have their own custom operating system, but everything else is PC components. Yeah. I mean, they might have, I think next cycle they'll just give up. I mean, you can change the... Yeah. <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll just brand it. You'll have the Microsoft or the Sony store, and then you can download it onto you whatever your there PC. You yeah, no, that works. <laughs> so, uh, if, yeah, from your perspective, you guys are, are technically smart people. Um, <laughs> On the technical side of PC gaming, so, I mean, does that change in infrastructure on the console side affect us in a positive way at all? Does it make it easier to port games? Well, I know working on the PS3 was a real pain in the ass when I was at Xi because uh, their whole setup was designed around um, first-party product for Sony. So they, they didn't really want you necessarily doing that well. So we had to use all this middleware. I can't remember what the middleware was, but we had to go out and buy middleware to allow us to develop on the PS3. It wasn't so bad with the 360 because it was essentially a PC. But you know, so so, but but yeah, that that was a real problem. But I know that the direction they're heading in with basically now boxing a PS a PC with the PS4. Then you know, I, 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 I would say everyone I know that's making next gen console games is actually developing them on a PC. Mm. So even if you go to the studio, there's probably a couple of development boxes and everyone else is on PCs. In fact, yeah. maybe even some of the games you've seen running on next-gen console are running yeah, on a yeah. PC. Yeah, just look, mm -hmm. look, look at how big the stand is underneath, yeah. <laughs> underneath the, uh, the thing that you're playing at on the show floor. So you're saying look underneath the hood. Yeah, this was a pretty big deal when we learned about the Xbox One and the PS4, and they were both moving very 
clearly towards a PC architecture, that was a, that was a, that was a big deal. That was kind of like, okay, they get it. They can't keep throwing a bunch of wacko hardware at developers and expecting them to architect to this thing. And it, it's, it is, there has to be efficiencies and, and the PC is clean, the, the architecture is clean. The operating systems and some of the other stuff that we've dealt with has not been, but the architecture is. is <laughs> no one could is, ever claim that Windows was clean. <laughs> Ever. No, and I, I, uh, I wouldn't dirty. make that claim. I'm just saying from a pure, if you're into hardware architecture, you look at it, it's yeah. great. I mean, look at the PDP-8, the PDP-11, look at some of those early 60s and 70s computer architectures. I mean, these, this stuff is, you know, it's, it's got a really nice orthogonal design. And then you look at all the craziness that came out in the last 20 years in consoles, and, and we're right back where we belong, a nice, clean architecture. It's beautiful. Well, the, the PC, just like was brought up before, it supports that innovation, like the, the Rift, right? So like you were saying, it comes out from the PC because there's a lot of different companies. Anyone can just make something and try it out. So it kind of, it's this wild, you know, this wild economy that just lets something rise out and rise up very quickly. Like the Rift or if someone, you know, a new company starts up a good idea and they can roll with it much faster than having to wait for a console cycle and then win Sony or Microsoft's favour. I, I, I really re clearly remember the late 90s actually was an amazing time for this because, you know, you get this box from you know Nvidia or from 3DFX, and you'd plug it in, and it would be this incredible new experience. And there was just all this innovation happening, and you know it wasn't clear that that was you know th that that was obviously going to win. It was expensive and all this kind of stuff. I remember the Nvidia guys going out on these road shows, you know, trying to get people to develop for this for this crazy hardware that they were building. But that competition and, and that innovation that we've had for the last 15 years has brought us to the point we are now. And all of the technology in these next-gen consoles is all, all comes from that. Exactly. Right? It all exactly. comes from that. All right, I'm going to steer us away from hardware and toward a topic everybody loves, piracy. Uh, what is, what's left to be done to address piracy on PC, if anything? Well, we're never going to address it if you can run it on a machine without any kind of a, a back-end server. It's always going to get hacked. So the, the server has, is the solution, the yeah. MMO, the, yeah. uh, the stuff that, you know, you, the, all, the, all the big success stories, almost all of them have some sort of a back-end server that makes sure that people can't, uh, can't run it without uh, having paid for it. And it works. Yeah, that is literally the only solution to piracy. It does work. But I think, I think the important thing there is that it's, it's got to be value-added. So they've got to be like, okay, I'm playing on the central server and it gives me this persistent character. If you just do it the SimCity way, you end up really paying off your customers. You mean, you mean that, well, so that, that where they had everything simulated but on the cloud? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, so, I, I think there's also the question of, is it actually a good idea to try to eliminate piracy completely? I mean, it's a trade-off with the whole server thing and offline. Uh, like, we've committed to, to releasing the server for our game and I know that there's going to be you know, probably yeah. five people playing it for everyone that, that bought it, but, you know, it is what it is. I mean, yeah, I mean, I generally, I think in general, you know, there a vast majority of people are good and honest, and the people that would be pirating anyway may not be buying your game. And in some ways, a certain amount of piracy is sort of like advertising, because, you know, people like it. And then if they actually have a good experience, then occasionally they'll be like, oh, maybe I'll buy, buy it. Or yeah, buy no, the next network one. effects and all that kind of stuff. But you know what, I'd rather have someone play the game than not play it, you know what I mean, at the end of the day? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, so, yeah, I'm... I think the, the worst thing is, and maybe I'm thinking too much as a consumer here, but the worst thing for me is when the piracy gets, the anti-piracy methods get into the way, in the way of me as a legitimate consumer. And the amount of times that happens, and I want to say the company, but I don't want to burn them off. I, I played a game recently that's by a reasonably well-known publisher and I had to install their client to play it and all this other stuff going on on my PC. just really annoyed me when I knew that I could go out there and turn it, you know, and here I was, this legitimate customer getting totally screwed around installing all this extra stuff for, for no added value for me as a consumer. Yeah, well, those were tough years dealing with that on-disk copy protection. Oh, man. <laughs> we just, you know, us de de just know from a developer standpoint, we hated it. We were told usually at the end of the project, oh, by the way, this is the system you're gonna to have to install. It hurt performance. Mm. It, 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 it hurt our, our most loved and valuable uh, and, and faithful customers who loved our, our, loved our stuff. And, it and, just, and it also just, we were forced to do it, right? Well, we were totally forced to I mean, do it. I mean, there wasn't and then, a choice. And then, and then after it ships, 
we put out a patch to disable it. Yeah. How fucked up is that? Okay? We lived this. It was like, it was like, oh. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Tell us how you feel, that's great. Um, so, yeah, again, one of, one of the advantages of having multiple stores in PC gaming is, hey, those stores compete, and we're living in a time, we're gaming in a time where games have probably never been cheaper on PC, it's incredible. Bundles are happening every week through Humble Bundle and other, other websites. Um, but I'm curious, like, do you guys see any downside to so this sort of aggressive saleization, you know, putting on sale of so many games? Is there any downside to that? Well, I know with, with us, because we're, we're really close to obviously releasing, and we were just talking about this before. So with, with Daisy, we really kind of boxed ourselves into a corner with, with announcing our pricing structure very, very early on. But I think there's many factors, now I've learned, there's many factors to how you might want to do your pricing structure, you know, like planetary annihilation, say, you know, pricing it in a, in a way that, um, that can help with the development approach and the launch approach that you want to have. I think Prison Architect's another good example for me, you know, priced quite high, so to only attract that particular audience. So I, I think there's, there's many aspects that your pricing structure can bring to your project. It's not just how much money you make, it's also how you introduce your customer, whether it's LinkedIn with your Kickstarter and all that kind of stuff. I've learned that, but yeah, through maybe doing it wrong. <laughs> I've, I've thought games are overpriced actually for a really long time. Um, and, and it's not that, that, the, that the, the price shouldn't be set at, you know, whatever the developer wants to set it at, but it kind of felt like 60 bucks was, was kind of pushing it. Now, I'm the guy with the $90 game on Steam, so that's, <laughs> that's probably, you know, but there's reasons for that, right? But that's not to say it's, the price is always going to be that way, but I just always felt like we were restricting the audience of our games because they were so expensive. You can only afford to buy so many $50, $60, $70 dollar games. If you can pick up a game for five bucks on Steam, you may not have ever bought that game. So I, personally, I think it's a good thing. Maybe, maybe we're going a little too far with it. Maybe, but um, yeah. jury's out. I, I, think. Mean, and, and, I mean, I'm all for it, but I mean, I don't think anyone has their games reduced in pricing on Steam without their agreement. Mm -hmm. And I think generally, if you talk to Valve or the companies, they'll tell you that their revenue increased by having those sales because essentially you're getting people that probably wouldn't have bought your game that maybe they're going, oh, okay, I'll try that for $10 or $15 or whatever. How, how uh, many people... So, it's, I think, a, a good thing, basically. Yeah, I'm sorry, Chris. How many people have, like, 50 games on Steam they haven't played yet? They're going to play them one day, yeah, but they had them on Steam. There you go. That's, sale. That, that's, that's the price. Those are sales that were never going to happen, and there you go. I sleep. Extra money for the developers and, and Valve, obviously. I sleep better at night <laughs> now that I've got them. I'm just saying. <laughs> But if you want to talk about overpriced games as well, is there anyone from Australia or New Zealand out there? A couple of people now. They know about overpriced games. I think I paid like $130 for Skyrim just because it's New Zealand. So regional pricing of games really sucks as well. And so, there, was no, there was downloaded through Steam. You, you Damn you, you Gabe Newell. I literally had to. And I thought I was going to, on Steam, I thought I was going to have to get it, I was going to get it early because Australia and New Zealand unlocked early, but there was a problem and it meant we actually got it later. Yeah. So, I'm, still, I'm, I'm bitter. <laughs> I can put that American flag back up there if you like. <laughs> sure. So uh, another question related to business models. Um, most of you guys actually are going to our, are currently selling pre-release versions of your games. I'm curious, you know, this is a huge trend across PC gaming in general, just the ability, arguably started with Minecraft or got popular through Minecraft, the ability to buy an unreleased, unfinished game play it up until the point it's released. Has, has this trend at all changed? How you guys make games or, yeah? Well, I would say completely. I mean, I just, mm -hmm. actually, there's probably a few, no how many people here have uh, back Star Citizen, by the way? Um, so we, yeah, we literally released what we call the hangar module, which is like about as early as I've ever released anything in my life. I wouldn't give a publisher a build for at least another year. Uh, and it, it, obviously it's a pretty contained uh, component of the game, but it allows you to walk around in the engine, look at your ships, fiddle around with them a little bit. Uh, and it's actually, I mean, I'm actually enjoying the iterative process because I think it's really good for the team. It really focuses on, it's definitely something I could never have done in a traditional publishing setup and definitely could not have done in a console setup. 
Uh, and uh, it's great because, I mean, we're seeing, you know, we can see feedback. We can, I mean, you know, within 10 minutes of it getting released, there was all these Twitch TV streams of people walking around the hangar. Uh, and it was, uh, I have to say, as a developer, it's completely invigorating because you work on stuff and you, you, you know, you, you like what you do and you, and you're kind of proud of it, and you sort of want to share and show it. And a lot of times in the old setup, you weren't allowed to show, show it at all because everyone wanted it locked down, and then there'll be a very carefully orchestrated sort of PR and publicity plan for the six months before you're going to launch it. And in sort of the open PC environment, especially the sort of more indie setup that, that I'm lucky enough to be in right now, um, it's awesome to actually show the stuff that you're working on to people that care. Right. Yeah, publishing yeah. executives don't really care. They just want to know when the date's going to be there and are they going to make money. Uh, you know, everyone out here, I think, they, they just want to see something cool. And as a developer, generally, you have fun making something cool and you like to show it. So yeah, everything I'm, I'm Chris said, said times 100. And, you know, we literally can check in code at 8 o'clock in the morning, do a build, play test it, and have it released by noon, right? Like, that is live game development right there. And it is amazing. Iteration, just build your game release it as you go. It is freaking amazing. Yep. No, I, 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 I was at Gamescom. I was giving some interviews, and I sort of likened it to it's not just doing live theater. It's like you're doing live theater, and you've invited the audience to the workshop before you've done the play and uh, get their feedback. But, you know, it's, so, so it does have a few little wrinkles, but it's, uh, I think, a lot of fun. I think as well, like, for me, the, the prime example is Kerbal Space Program. So when that game first... Uh, sort of hit, hit the world, it was a, its scope was very limited. And I, I know those guys, they didn't really have any idea of the scope th that it is now. But the fact that it started to become so popular, and yet it was still so early in its design sort of, you know, process, meant that the scope could change rapidly to build out and flesh out. Like if they'd finished that whole game and then launched it, I think it would have been much lower in scope. Than, than it is now. So I, I, you know, I'm kind of thankful that, that that process allows a cool game like KSP to come out and actually get fleshed out in front of your eyes. By the way, that game is super awesome. If you don't own it, you should really check it out. And, and another one's Prison Architect, and they, they damn well released the public alpha 13 while I was on the plane, so I can't play it now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks for your comments, guys. At this point, we're gonna open it up to audience participation and question asking. We have about 15 minutes remaining in the panel. So I want to ask you guys to just focus your questions, only ask one question, please. And yeah, look forward to hearing your guys' responses. I'll call to you. I'm going to alternate right and left to my right. So go ahead. All right. Uh, so I actually have a question about what you guys were just talking about with the uh, iterative approach to releasing a game. Can you see game development getting to the point where the finished product is almost like an afterthought? where you're engaging enough of your interested community and where some of the fun is actually seeing the game change that maybe the core experience for your community is taking place during development rather than after? Uh, well, for me, I, I think it depends on the kind of game. Mm -hmm. um, so in the game I'm making right now, it's a very big game and sort of has a lot of open sandbox elements. Uh, so I actually, the iterative process and you know, for me, the journey of everyone that's sort of back the game uh, to get to the final game. I want everyone to have as much fun with that process that when they get to the final game, they feel like the final game's a bonus. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily gonna work for every single kind of game. So like, for instance, you know, say, uh, say Tim Schafer's doing Broken Age and you know, it's a specific narrative game. So there's only so much of that you really can show. So for instance, on what I'm doing, the Squadron 42 part, I'm probably not gonna share nearly as much as I share in the general Star Citizen part because obviously you want some of that to be discovery. So it depends on the game, but if you're making a sort of bigger, I mean, I think Daisy's another sort of big sandbox game, then I think it's kind of fun to share it. And it actually is really useful because you always have choices. You, you, you have so much you can do in so much time. And so knowing what's interesting to people is very useful. So you can say, oh, I mean, we, we had this situation where I, we ran a survey after we did the initial campaign and saying, okay, what do you want to be? Do you want to be a pirate, a mercenary, merchant, an explorer? And you know, thinking back to the old games I made, like Style, uh, like uh, Privateer and, and Freelancer, I was thinking, well, most people will probably want to be doing sort of combat, sort of piracy, mercenary, bounty hunting stuff. And we had 67% of the people say they wanted to be explorers. And so at that point, we're like, all right, let's <laughs> let's put more explorer features in there. We definitely need more gameplay for that. 
Uh, and that helps out. It just sort of helps on, on the focus. But I, I do think that, like I said, there will be some games that it works well for and some games that it won't work so well for. I think what you're describing actually already happens in many cases. World of Tanks is probably an example. League of Legends is an example. I mean, these games are services that are just going to live on until they have no reason to live anymore. And that could be an awfully long time. You know, who would have thought that World of Warcraft would still, uh, you know, even though it's, it's shrunk a little bit, who would have thought it would still be yeah, on top? It's, it's got, what, seven million? Yeah, it's only seven <laughs> It's million. only got seven million. <laughs> All right, uh, gentleman on the left. Uh, hello. Um, apologies in advance, I'm not very well smoke it, spoken. Like um, the last person that Chris Roberts had an interaction with with our community, known as White Shirt Guy, um, he brought up a question on the live stream about non-consensual PvP in Star Citizen and got called a griefer on the internet. Um, my question uh, is about that, is, and you answered it previously, but how do you feel about game mechanics in multiplayer games that are more about punishing a player for something bad he did versus preventing him from taking that action? Uh, question for me specifically, well, right? Uh, or in general? Squirrel. Time? Sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I will say that my feeling of games today is that they sort of, I don't know, mollycoddle everyone a bit too much. So I, I do miss, I mean, I, I, you know, I think I've made no secret that like one of my favorite games of the last X number of years was Demon's Souls, the PS3 one, which was like completely hardcore, old school, punishing if you... But the thing was with the game was that it was always your fault if you messed up. It wasn't arbitrary, and it was just if you got lazy. Like, I always, like... You'd get towards the end of the level and you were like making a decision, do I fight the boss or do I go back and spend those souls I've got? And then you, you weren't paying attention to a sort of a junior monster and you, and you lost it all and, you, and you're like, Arr! I almost threw the controller at my TV about, well, more times than I, could, uh, I would care to, re to recount. But there was something about that because when I actually finished it, I really had pride and, and I spent 200 hours playing that game, which for me, playing a game is a huge amount of time. So I actually sort of lean towards uh, making a game that is maybe slightly more punishing than is what is the norm nowadays. Uh, maybe not quite as punishing as the game that's made to my left here. Uh, <laughs> but but I, there is definitely something about that. So, uh, you know, I, I think, and I think gaming sort of missed that. That's, that's my personal opinion. May not necessarily be the same for everyone here, but... Mine's pretty so. simple. I think any... any um arbitrary type process or in fact any any pushing the player in a direction for how they play the game I don't like but that, that really reflects the kind of games I play and I always add the caveat I you know I play a very extreme kind of game like I probably played the most you know of Space Station 13 here out of any game this year and it's a free game so yeah mine's pretty simple I, don't know about I think you else. also have to look at the popularity of the roguelikes you know things like FTL mm -hmm. that's a really hard game I mean you know, beating the boss is like a real challenge there. You know what? That's awesome. Yeah, well, that's the old days it used to be. I mean, like, it used to be really hard to beat games. And yeah, I, no I, saves on the Amiga, like, yeah, you know, I mean, stuff like that. Now it's like I, I play a console game and it's like, uh, oh, I just run into a room, I don't care, I get killed, I respawn one second before. It's, it's, it's basically sloppy gameplay, so work for it. That's what I think. <laughs> All right, next question. Thank you. Um... My question is about the, um, like, it's, it's related to the release of RuneScape, which I haven't, you know, checked out on, so if my details are off, I apologize. Um, but um, RuneScape is coming out with their next iteration of their game. It's going to be completely browser-based uh, using HTML5 code. Um, I'm wondering if a game like this is released within browser and has a really strong uh, release, um, would that mean a new upsurge of... Um, high quality games made for the browser platform. It's inevitable that the browser is going to ultimately be uh, a super powerful way of delivering games. The problem I think we have is the JavaScript. The execution time is anywhere between 10 and 100 times slower than native compiled code. So that's the problem right now. But the, once you shove it down onto the graphics card through WebGL, you've got, you've got a really great frame rate. You've got great performance there. Uh, some of the demos you see are fantastic, but the trouble is it's the JavaScript, so we need to figure out a way to get 
uh, an inter a more of a, a more powerful intermediate language type compiler situation running inside the browser. It's going to take some time. I don't know. The, I don't know the answer. Google has their uh, native client solution has it, its downsides, unfortunately. Right, and the sandbox is kind of interesting that it runs in. You know, but the thing is, is that it's going to happen. I mean, we have Java, we have uh, Unity, we have all these other solutions. We just we just need for something to mature and come out of it. But uh, there's no reason why the browser or uh, uh, a a, a platform that there's nobody, it's, it's an open organization that's uh, running it, like W3C, Kronos, et cetera. That's, uh, that's exciting to me. It's one of the most, that's why I jumped on that answer because I am super excited about it. And I even, I don't know if this is true, but I thought I read that Microsoft's going to support WebGL true. in, in yep, direct, that's true. In, uh, pardon me, in, um, in um, IE11. And if that happens, this is a huge uh, victory for uh, the open uh, spec specification of WebGL. So, so we, we actually went the other way with our game and, and our interface, our whole front end and in-game UI is a web browser overlaid over the game world, right? I mean, you can write WebGL code inside of our UI, which is pretty wacky, yeah. but so I, I, I agree with Chris 100%. It's a beginning, it's a beginning. We'll, we'll keep making progress. Very interesting. All right, uh, gentlemen, the green shirt. Hello. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering, since uh, Microsoft is doing its new Microsoft-y thing with 8, uh, do you think more of the, what was the PC market is going to go to a Linux or other type of operating system, but still a desktop type market? You know, I think Google is going to steal it right away from Microsoft. I almost said this earlier when we were talking about Windows, uh, you know, 8 and all the different restrictions. Google is my favorite company still when it comes to the, how smart they are and how aggressive they are and all the cool shit that they just continuously do. Now I know they slowed down a little, okay, but these guys are going to, they're going to do a lot more in this, this space and uh, it, it sometimes is hard to keep up with all the stuff they're doing. But I, I think that uh, I, I put my money on Google and their, their Chrome book and their Chrome solutions and, and the stuff they're doing there than I would on Linux at this point. But the, the uh, problem I have is didn't people say the same things about Microsoft, certainly when I was a kid? So the concern I have with, Microsoft, uh, with, with Google is are they too smart? And the thing I like about Linux is that it's an open platform, so that feels kind of good for me. Like I know yeah, no, I from what I think that. about it, I'd, I'd like to have you know, my games on Linux. That the, thi would be the thing about great. Linux is we need somebody with a strong kind of pimp hand to, to kind of <laughs> get, it, get it working right. And, and Valve could very well uh, yeah, you know, exactly. be that, but it's not, happened, Lin it's not Linux, happened yet. Linux was my choice for 15 years, and then I just, I just was not seeing an advance. It just, was, it just stopped, and I just, it was sad. Yeah, we're, we're releasing stuff on Linux now, and it is, it's a very challenging platform at the moment. Um, but then again, so is Mac, so. Cool, good question. I think we got time for one or two more. Go ahead. Um, so I'm very excited to hear about social multiplayer and putting things more on the server side, but, and I'm surprised this hasn't come up, where does that leave modding? Where does that leave player mods? I mean, I think SimCity was kind of the classic example of SimCity Forest had a rich modding community and then you put it all on the server and it's, you know, it's there, but it's just not the same. I mean, what do you, what do you th where, is, where is this going? I mean, is, are we going to know more mods? Or? Well, I don't want to kick SimCity while it's down, but I, I suspect that was probably part of the design. Um, you know, it's like I think that if, uh, like if DICE wanted to kill, like, armor, all they'd need to do would be release their modding, some modding tools tomorrow. Pfft, gone, you know, like, um, I, it, was, it always really hurt me when, when Battlefield 2 was kind of, you know, the end in terms of modding. So I, I'm pretty obviously supportive of, of the whole modding idea. But like you say, and that's the challenge that we're trying to deal with with Daisy at the moment, is how do we have the, I guess, stability and security of, a, of an online community, you know, like, like Wargaming has, um, at the same time as support modding? I mean, I don't have the answer for that. So, so the answer is that um, there's going to be games that are going to allow it, and there's going to be games that aren't, and the difference is going to be, do you have access to the server? I mean, that... Yeah, uh, you know. I mean, I, well, I, I mean, I'm doing it in Star Citizen. I mean, you, you definitely can mod and you can run your own servers, but if you want to be on the big persistent universe that everyone else is on, obviously, you can't mod in that situation because you know that's. But it, there is it a, wouldn't work if someone built a battleship that could you know blow everyone but up. But there's also the kind of mod. workshop route that you can yeah. go where, where people can create content and then you can integrate it into the game. 
Uh, and there's also so community mod packs too. Like EgoSoft did that with X3. Um, they were they took they took a whole bunch of the good community mods and they released an official patch that put the stuff in. We we actually look at our game as a the game is a platform. I mean that that's kind of what we call it, game as a platform. So we're 100% committed to modding. We think it's super super important. Um, you know I think Valve has been leading the way in terms of uh, taking user generated content and putting it in the game. And uh, it's a smart move, so we're, we're going to do the same thing. But uh, we do have to release the server to make that happen. And, uh, you know, that has its downsides as well. But modding is really, personally, I'm, I'm passionate about it myself, so I just want it to exist. I wonder how many people would never have played Total Annihilation if we hadn't have made it moddable, right. you know? I mean, that's the thing. It was it just, and, and, and also, it was. How many people would be playing it today? It, and, right? and could have been, oh, well, nobody would be playing it today if yeah. it was moddable. And uh, pirating on the pirating thing, nobody, nobody would have even heard of it if it wasn't piratable. So this, <laughs> this I struggle with as well. And Chris, I know, has the same history. Anyway. Yeah, no, but freelancer people play today. There's all these great mods for it. I mean, that was sort of almost the, the online multiplayer modding stuff was right at the end of the production. And, I mean, it's amazing. It's like nine years later. It's yeah. like it's an old it game. Keeps it, and it keeps it alive. Keeps it alive. So and, now and I think modding is very important. I think in the PC world, it's actually, you know, just user-generated content is a major part of PC gaming. And I think if you don't embrace it in your game at some, at some point, I think it hurts you. So. Half the people I work with in the industry started out modding. That's, yeah. how, they, that's mm. how they started making games. Thank you. Great. All right, so we have just a few minutes left. Let's see if we can squeeze one more question in. All right, quick comment for Daisy, Mr. Hall, obviously. Uh, I, you know, played Daisy since the very beginning, big group of us, and uh, I know on the Reddit forums and all the Daisy community, you're getting a lot of pressure to release the alpha early. I just want to give you an alternate perspective. When we started, we had 40 people playing. We have five now that are hardcore, and they've all left because of the bugs and everything else that we know about from Arma that came that way. I just want to give you an alternate perspective. Take your time. We'll wait. We'll play the mod. And that way, when these people come back that have committed to coming back, they don't see that and immediately leave. That's my biggest fear with Daisy. But great work otherwise. So. Cool. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think as well, like, it's, it's an interesting point, And I think you saw it with, with Notch, with his troubles with, you know, developing his game. And I, I totally agree with where he's coming from because it does get kind of hard and... Uh, I think that, yeah, I mean, I, but I, at the end of the day, I don't think community pressure is a bad thing. I think there's a lot of people out there, like friends of mine who are indie game designers who would love to have that kind of crazy audience pushing to have stuff out. And I think that's where, like, events like PAX, where I can actually talk to other developers and get other sensible perspectives in that as well really helps. Yeah, I think Minecraft's almost an instance where, because it was moddable, it allowed people to sort of express themselves in, in that sort of lull um, it, were, it got so popular so quickly, and yet Mojang was still like four or five people trying to catch up, trying to meet their demand, trying to develop enough content to meet people's, uh, what they wanted. And uh, the modding community just came in and built what people wanted. Yeah, and, and managing the growth can be really hard as well, because we've, we've gone from having like five people, we're about to move into a new office, because we realized that at holding, that the one that we got to move into wasn't going to hold 50 people. So trying to deal with your accidental project can be really hard as well. Particularly when you, you wanted to make the game, like if you look at Notch, he wanted to make small, fun games, not massive, big ones where he can't just stream him coding or whatever. Right. All right, I want to mention as a quick PSA, we have another panel happening on Monday. If you like PC gaming trivia and you like winning prizes, one o'clock in the Serpent Theater. But thanks so much to our guests, Dean Hall, Chris Roberts, John Mabor, Chris Taylor. Big round of applause, please. Thank you for coming.